What up, everybody? I'm Dave Miranda, and this is episode 78 of Just Give Me Five. I hope you guys are doing great, continue to be amazing. We got another awesome show lined up for you today. But if you guys caught episode 77, you saw we had none other than the one and only Mystic Blue. And let me tell you, it was a treat to have Patrice on the show. I've known Patrice since about, I want to say around 2005, 2000, going on 2006. And uh, we met um, like at the Hidden House back in the day. That's where everybody used to go. We used to do a lot of shows there. And uh, everybody in the scene used to be there. It was a cool underground spot. Shout out to Al Page. He used to run it. And um, she's just always been a dope person, man. Just such an amazingly talented individual. And uh, it was great to hear her story. Um, you know, I'm a big Prince fan. So her being from Minneapolis, I was just like, I got to hear all about the town. I love it. I've been in Minneapolis myself. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's just awesome, man. So nothing but love and respect to you, my friend. And I wish you nothing but continued success. Thank you. All right. But today's guest is another individual who has been a factor in the Arizona scene for many, many years now. We're going to talk about how he got in the industry. We're also going to talk about his time with Jive Records. We're going to talk about his Radio Supa and Rock the Mic show and so much more. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present to you TJ Supa. Yo, what's good everybody? This is TJ Super Duper and all I'm saying is just give me five. How did I get into the industry? Me getting into the industry was really interesting. I landed an internship at Jive Records and I interned literally 40 hours a week for, for months, months and months. I moved from Arizona to New York and uh, I was back in New York interning every single day um, until uh, you know they finally started to pay my, pay my transportation and food and uh, everything after that worked out great, you know what I mean? Just yeah. moving back to New York, getting used to that environment again, uh, that's kind of what that was. That was the beginning of me getting into the music industry and then, you know, it just kind of moved forward and went to a couple of different places from there. But that was the beginning of me getting into the industry. And what motivated you to get in the industry? What was the whole thing that sparked that? Man, I've loved, I've been in love with music since I was 10 years old. Okay. Um, I remember watching a, a Run DMC video, and I, I kind of consider that the beginning of me s s wanting to start to write music, wanting to start to rap, yeah. and uh, and just beginning my rap career all the way, battle rapping all the way through high school, and then getting out of high school, and then yeah. you know going to school for music after that. So that was the beginning. My my beginning of music literally started at 10 years old, and just moved forward from there, and never never stopped to this day. Working with Jive Records was really interesting. This is how it happened. So after high school, I went to school for music business and I'm in school with a friend of mine, Kawan the Shogun. At night, he's on the, he's on the, uh, he's looking through the new times and uh, he finds this recording school, Conservatory Recording Arts, and yeah. they teach you about engineering. So I say, after I finish this music business class, I'm gonna go to, recording, to the Conservatory Recording Arts. Yeah. I go to the Conservatory Recording Arts and we're going through the engineering program. I have no idea what engineering is before I walk into this school. Right. And I'm learning and I'm learning. And one day, Kurt, the administrator of the school, I think he's still there now, big salute to him. He comes in the class and it, just, it was just like somebody busting in the class and he was like, okay, look, there was 10 students in our class. And he says, eight out of the 10 of you need to leave the state. You guys have to move. And it literally would be like somebody just walking in and telling you, Dave Miranda, you need to move. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it was like. So I'm like, wow, we just need to move. Like nobody, nobody told us about this or we didn't think about this before. So literally, that's what it was. So you, you have to move. So I said, okay, cool. So I went home, you know, I told my mother about it. And then, um, you know, at the end of that school, you have to gain an internship. Yeah. So we started, I started talking to my mother about, you know, cause we still had family back in New York. I had aunts and uncles since that's yeah. where we originally moved from. Right. So I said, okay, cool. So I went through my records and tapes. I kind of spread all my records and everything on the ground. Right. And I'm looking at, of course, like LL Cool J bad, you know, so I'm seeing Def Jam and I'm looking at like, you know, Steady B. And then I'm looking at, 
This has got to be. I was trying not to date myself, no, but no, this no, has no, got. No, this has got to be. This has got to be about ninety. This has got to be ninety three, ninety four. Got you. In okay. between ninety three, ninety four, probably okay. early ninety four. Okay. So I'm spreading all my stuff out on the ground. I'm looking at Boogie Down Productions. I'm looking at Steady B. I'm looking at LL Cool J. I'm looking at all these records, and I'm looking at the labels and all the records. You know, and um, I'm seeing Def Jam. I'm seeing Cold Chillin', I'm seeing Jive. Those are the ones I'm seeing. Ones, so I go back to school and I tell them, okay, look, for an internship, I wanna go here, 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 here. Right. And they're like, okay, cool. And then nothing. And then like two weeks later, they come back and they're like, hey, Jive Records wants you in New York. Wow. So, you know, I had a conversation with mom, we worked everything out and I moved to New York with $300 twenty dollars and I owed my brother 120 but nonetheless three hundred twenty dollars and 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 that's how I got to Jive Records that was me getting to Jive Records and Jive Records not only was it because I was 19 at the time that I moved yeah. so not only was it um an awakening because I'm you know I moved from New York to here when I was four and I came up in Arizona and then I moved back at 19. So going back at 19 and, and we're walking into Manhattan, there's a whole different culture shock that you're not used to because you're not used to seeing these things in, in Phoenix. You know what I mean? So it's a completely different situation. Then you walk into Jive and then there's people that you just were watching them on TV. You're just listening to their CD or just listening to their tape. And then they're walking past you in the hallway, you know, like yeah. Keith Murray might be there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, or at that time, Tribe was on job. Tribe was hot. So the lady that I worked for, there was another lady named Laurel that sat one, one seat over from, from my boss's boss. Wow. That lady, Laurel, was the computer voice on the Tribe Called Quest album. So when I'm getting wow. there, when I'm getting there, like walking in, like, hi, T I'm TJ, nice to meet you. Yeah. I'm talking to the lady who's doing the computer voice on Tribe Called Quest oh album. So that's what the culture shock was like. Like, yeah. and again, I'm 19, so my, my head was blown, but you have to kind of hold it in, you know, sure, because sure. you're in a new environment, you're in a celebrity environment, and you got to act like you're in a, you're, you, you belong like in this environment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's, that's what Jive Records was. Jive Records was a really beautiful situation. It was the beginning of me being in the industry. And uh, I interned there for nine months, six of those nine months. My mother would send me money to live every oh. whatever. So I'm eating like two pieces of pizza a day. You know what I mean? And I'm traveling from Long Island to New York. If you guys understand how far that is, oh, it's, a, it's a trip every single day, five days a week, back and forth. Right. And uh, at one point, uh, a lady on another floor comes to me and she says, yo, TJ, we see you here working all the time. If you work for us, we'll pay your food and transportation. And I'm thinking, that's amazing. I can go tell my mother she didn't have to send me money anymore. It's been almost six months, you know. So I go to tell my boss, like, hey, you know, uh, they, uh, they upstairs, I love working for you, but they said that they'll pay my food and transportation. So she goes into her boss's office and they have a conversation in there for like 30 minutes. And they come out and they're like, okay, TJ, we just talked to accounting. We were supposed to be paying you the whole time. So now we're going to back pay you. Wow. And that was a jackpot. That was my, that was my jackpot at Jive Records. Yeah, yeah. How long were you there for? I was at Jive Records for nine months. Things really picked up because when I got released, I, there wasn't a specific reason that I was ever let, told that I was let go. You know, I had like yeah. my own computer, my own phone line. At some point, we were discussing salary for a position that I had created that I'm sure somebody gets paid for today. But um, wow. what happened was they just said, hey, you, you have to leave. And I'm like, did I do something wrong? They're like, no, you didn't. You just have to go. And they're like, OK, so they gave me a week. And in that week, I sent out my application to a bunch of places. I missed oh, a yeah. phone call from Bad Boy. Um, which would have probably been another interesting story. And uh, the lady who sat next to my direct boss, the one under the computer voice, the one who worked under the computer yeah. voice, she had left a couple months earlier and went to another big recording studio named The Hit Factory. The Hit Factory. So when I got let go, my boss told her and she called me and said, TJ, we want you to come work at The Hit Factory. Wow. And that was another big, amazing situation. You know what I mean? Left there, worked at the Hit Factory, and that was uh, amazing. The first first couple of months, I was working a Jodeci session, a 24-hour Jodeci session. Hit Factory was amazing because it was like, it was like you wouldn't even go three or four days without seeing an A-list celebrity come in. Absolutely. 
you, you just wouldn't, you know. This was this was so this was this was the show, the the party, the after party. This was, Jodis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This yeah. is about then. This is about this was probably about ninety five. I was there from ninety five till ninety seven. I was at Hit Factory, um, wow. and and again, you know, Big is there one day, Puff is there one day, Mariah's across the hall. Black Street is downstairs. That was just every day. Like Michael Jackson came in. You know what I mean? And people would be up against the glass trying to get in. But <laughs> I didn't. When 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 MJ came in, they blocked the elevators. They blocked oh, yeah. the front door. Oh, yeah. Like I think they I think somebody said they were driving him around like dressed like an old man inside of a inside of a yeah, inside of a a walker or yeah, you know the a, a chair so right. you couldn't they blocked our elevator i had to go upstairs a different way they so yeah the they don't do that for the president <laughs> no <laughs> they don't they don't but they did that for mj right. you know what i'm saying so yeah so the hit factory was a it was another beautiful situation you know what i mean i worked there for you know from 95 to 97 yeah. and uh one of the big engineers there and this was this ended up being a really a really good friend of mine i became really good friends with his family but okay. one of the big engineers there herb powers he came to me and he was like yo tj i'm gonna open my own studio nobody yeah. knows about it don't tell anybody right. because it would kind of put him in competition with the hit factory oh, when it happens sure, yeah. so he's like yo tj okay cool i want you to come over and work with me yeah. so we was there, so till 97, he opened his own studio, and then I went over to his studio. Okay. And his studio, again, he was the biggest engineer at the Hit Factory, so when he left, you can imagine the clientele was, then it was L.A. Reed, then it was Puffy every day, yeah, yeah. then it was Mace, then it was Mary J. And this is like, it's like an everyday thing, you know? It, 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 I, you know, and I always had this idea like, you know, I don't take pictures of things that we weren't in a social media age. This was before camera phones, yeah, yeah, but I don't take pictures of stuff that happens every day. It's like you're not going to if you work at the hospital. You're not going to go take pictures of clients every day because you know what I'm saying? Because you're going to see it tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it was like. This was like an everyday thing. So if I didn't see that, if I saw something today, I'm going to see Jimmy Jam tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to see Teddy Riley tomorrow. You know, I'm going to see MC Light. You know, I'm, so that's what it was. Every single day, basically from Jive Records through through that time at Herb Powers, which that was from 97 to 2000. Wow. Yeah. And that's how that period was. And then he left his company and I started working for Robert Clavillas from CNC Music Factory, if you guys remember them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. So I started working for Robert Clavillas. Um, for CSC for another two years. And that was another myriad of different beautiful things that occurred there. Um, but yeah, that's that that time frame ended up being about just eight, nine years. It was an eight, nine year time frame. And I had family things that happened that caused me to move back to Arizona. Yeah, definitely. It would probably lead right into the next question. <laughs> yo, this is, yo, I didn't say this on camera. So her L.A. Reid, you know who L.A. Reid is? Okay, so Herb was really good friends with L.A. Reid. So Herb is like, yo. That name sounds very familiar. Yeah, Herb, you probably does, because he does, a, he does, he did like, he created like a lot of records. Like an IG Live interview with somebody Right. Or so he says to L.A. Reid, and he goes, L.A. Reid, TJ raps, go ask him to rap. And I'm like, you know, but again, I think I'm 20 at this point. And he comes over and he's like, yo, TJ, Herb just said you rap. Can you rap for me? And then like, you know, like in recording school, they don't teach you to try to be the center of the attention. You know what I'm saying? They teach you like, yo, you know, calm down, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, yeah, I'll rap for you, but can I do it after my shift? Yeah, right. <laughs> right, right, right. But I should have blew up the spot. I mean, that's the dude, that's, that's, that's 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 outcast TLC, TLC Tony Braxton. Oh, yeah. That's the whole Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, all of them. So and I didn't yeah, rap for him. Record, yeah, and he ended up leaving and going on a date and I was and I'm and I ended up rapping for his A and R, which didn't turn out to be anything, but I should have stopped what I was doing to rap for him. So just add that if LA Reed comes to rap for you, I ask you to rap. Stop what you're doing. <laughs> stop, you just, do stop what you're doing and ask and, and just rap for him, you know what I'm saying? Regardless of where you're at. What inspired me to create Radio Supa? Um, 
I'm going to go back a little bit on this one because there's a path that happened. So I got down here when I moved back here. My brother was working on when I was there before I left. My brother does independent film, Chris Rogers, yeah. and he put out this film named Hoop Soldiers and I performed in it. And, I, and that was the first time I put a soundtrack together for a film. Okay. So I said, OK, cool. So I was looking for a way to get that soundtrack out. It didn't happen, okay. whatever. So when I moved back here, there was another film named Cody Black that we were working on. And I scored that one, put that together, yeah. and I was looking for a way to put this project out. And I didn't have a way to put this project out. Okay. And over the course of a year or two, I was watching some video and, and, it, and it put me at this place where, wait a second, don't wait for somebody to come. There's no record label, there's nobody coming to save you. You know what I'm saying? So if you want this to come out, you need to put it out yourself. So I said, okay, cool. So I started moving in that process and then I ended up getting that project on iTunes. You know, so I got the project on iTunes. This is way back before people put projects on iTunes. Right. So I got the project out and uh, I uh, the next project came up. It was another soundtrack. So okay. I put that together, scored the soundtrack, put it out, you know, met a lot of beautiful people. Yeah. Uh, it was a pop the clutch soundtrack. That soundtrack came out on that soundtrack. I made a record label to be able to distribute the things that I needed to distribute, you know, like I did with the first soundtrack. So I had to have a way to move it. OK, yeah. so then I was working on a project for a young lady, Queen Yanajaha. A lot of you guys know her. Yeah. I was working on her project and we had got to the point where we had just landed distribution for this project uh -huh. and I needed a way to push this project. I remember going to FM radio here and being like, yo, can we get this single in rotation? And they were like, well, we had that single in rotation already two years ago, so we're not going to put it back in rotation. So I was running into this also, wall of, the yeah, the record had come out before we finished the album project. So, um, I, you know, in my head, I'm like, I need to figure out a way to promote this project while it's happening. Like, I can't wait on it because we're in the middle of this project. So I had a friend of mine that's been talking to me about TJ. You should open a radio station. You should open a radio station. But life was really crazy then. Like yeah. I was like working. I was like, you know, my baby mothers were gone and locked up or something like that. You know what I'm saying? I was taking care of my kids. I was it was it was real life then. And I had just yeah. finished putting together this album project and doing photography and shooting a music video for the for this project we were working on. So that wasn't even in the question. Yeah. So I got to this point in this project, like I have no way to promote this. I said and I and I and I just had another album that I didn't have a way to promote before this. And there's a lot of creative people here and a lot of creative people, directors, you know, businesses, and they don't have a way to promote these projects because right. getting a song on the radio here was like almost like winning like a lottery ticket. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It just you just really couldn't just go up there and get a song on. So Radio Super got created because I felt like there was a need to be able to control the, the, the promotion and distribution yeah. of the projects that not only just me, but we as a whole like everybody in the vicinity were putting out we didn't have a way to push or promote those projects so radio super radio super the creation of radio super came from that thought process and when i thought about radio super you know i took the experiences that i had in new york um and i thought you know they would crack on me sometimes like oh tj you move here from arizona um, you guys got tumbleweeds out there, you know, you ride horses and stuff. It was just j jokes and stuff. But right, right. the thought process that I had. It's like, actually. Right, right. Well, yeah, today we still know. <laughs> but it was like the thought process that I had was um, that I couldn't just cater to what was happening here with the station. Right. I had to, like, touch the world. I had to reach out when we did Radio Super. We had to branch out and make sure that we were pushing music everywhere, not just here, you know. And I knew that we started to get something or we started to hit something <clears throat> when I would start to have artists from New York call me in Arizona to get on the air. Then I knew we were on to something because a little while ago we rode horses and now we're popping. You know what I'm saying? And we have the ability to move projects. And now everything is worldwide in terms of what we do. Yeah. And you've had, I mean, yeah, I mean, you guys have been, you guys have been running how long now? It's been 13 years. And I, and I want to say, I, I want to say it might be the longest running digital, like internet station in the history of the state, if I'm not incorrect. I don't remember. I only remember one person running before us and I, and that person isn't running anymore. You know what yeah, I'm saying? I believe, I believe you. Yeah. I, I, 
I want to say I agree. Yeah. 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 Because it's been, it's been, I think, 10 or 11 years. Yeah, it's been like 11 or more years with you. Because you were at the first Super Lyrical Project, I think. Yeah. And and we've done like like, nine or 10 of them. That was like 2010. That was like 2011, I think it was. 2010 or two. No, it might have been 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Because it started in 09. The station started in 09. And the first one we did, I think it was 2010. So, yeah. So that was, it's been 12 years with you. So, yeah, you, you pretty much watch. Almost all of it, yeah. The Rock the Mic show um, is a, uh, that's a music video show. And the the Rock the Mic show came together. All these things have really funny stories in terms of how they came together. Of course. Um, I, uh, you know, I was sitting on this show probably for about two years before I launched it. And it's been running for about five years now. But I was sitting on the show for about two years before we launched it. And, uh, and, uh, I had a, because, because what I wanted to do was, you know, this was before Facebook live, this was before Instagram live, before the lives, you know what I mean? You remember way back we used to do, we had this television station supervision a long time ago, you know what I mean? And we had just stopped it. And I said, I just want to do a show. I don't want to do a station right now. So with the rock the mic show, I had a friend of mine, uh, from urban music report, uh, Mike big salute. He contacted me one day and he's like, yo, TJ, yeah. you know, he, he was doing extremely well in terms of television. He had a show that was running on television. I always say across the bottom of America from Texas up to New York and it would air on Fox. So I always yeah. thought he did a really excellent job with that. Right. So he contacted me and he's like, yo, I'm looking to move into the digital space. Yeah. So um, we started, you know, he hit me up and we started working on the show and he told me the name of the show. And I forgot the name of the show. And in my head, I remembered the Rock the Mic show. And that's gotcha. what stuck with me because I forgot the name he, he said. And, uh, and then I had my aunt pass away, which was the one that I lived in New York with when I originally moved to New York to, stay, to work at Jive Records. So uh, she had passed away. So I had to fly out of town for a funeral. So I flew out of town for a funeral, came back. And on that Tuesday that I got back between then and the Saturday, I, I locked the logo down, put the first episode together, and then we launched the Rock the Mic show on that first Saturday that we came back. Okay. And, and the idea was we wanted to create a music video show. We wanted to create it in television format, not like in, yo, what's good, it's me, like, like live format, you know what I mean? But right. we wanted to create a television show, and I wanted to get it on a platform that was similar to a television platform, not just a, yo, what's good, a live platform. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So that was the, the thought process behind it. There was a lot of inspiration from, like, Yo! MTV Raps. There was a lot of inspiration from, like, you know, uh, you know the basement. Th- shows like that, because yeah. at the time, those shows, I believe, had just recently stopped airing, and there wasn't an avenue to move music videos for uh for the urban audience so a lot of similar thoughts with uh with the radio except we were moving music and videos this time you know what i mean so i wanted to have in-person interviews i like the idea that you know fab five freddy would show up at the the dungeon basement and interview outcast i I love seeing all those things you know what i'm saying all the stuff that dr dre dr dre and ed lover when they uh they did the last episode if you remember they invited all these all the rappers over to do it and that was the that was the catalyst for why I did the Super Lyrical Project, because I remember how they invited all these rappers over, and with on digital radio we're jumping subjects, but with digital radio, yeah, yeah, yeah. I um, I I felt like I wanted to do something that nobody else was going to be able to do. Right. Nobody else was going to invite twenty rappers to their house. You know what I'm saying? To do a show, yeah. nobody was going to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But those thoughts, that that thought initially stemmed from watching like that last episode of Yo MTV yeah. Raps when they were closing out. So, but again, going back to the Rock the Mic show, that's where the thought process and the creation of the Rock the Mic show came from. And now it's up. It airs on probably about ten different digital stations, uh, Amazon stations, Roku stations here and even in Canada. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's great. All the platforms are doing well right now. You play the, play the videos, but you also do interviews as well. Yeah. So we'll, it, it'll be probably, we shoot that show. It's about an hour long and we'll do uh, an interview and then we'll mix music videos into it. Gotcha. Yeah. Just like that. I got to get Jimmy Nelson on the show. Did we talk about that? Yeah, Did we that talk would be about great, that? Man. Right. Get him out of his shell. We got to get him out of his shell. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Jimmy booked in, man. Yeah. This is gonna be great, yo. Jimmy got stories. 
I, I believe he does. Yeah. I believe he does. Yeah. <laughs> Man, um, I think that's always a beautiful feeling and everything. I mean, I mean, the best thing that I could ask for, and I think I'm receiving more than that, but the best thing I could ask for is that, and I think that a lot of creatives probably feel about this, is that if you spend time and you create something that's beautiful, right. then you know you would like the beautiful thing or, or, or to be acknowledged for that beautiful thing or that that beautiful thing be acknowledged you know what i mean regardless of whatever it is you know if you paint a beautiful picture you want people to look at it and be able to say yo that was a beautiful picture so um i think that i've received that and 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 it's a lot more now now it's it's uh it's even difficult to feel you know it's like you know when they say if you throw a rock in the water you at some point you can't count the ripples anymore and those ripples have spread too big to count man so um, I got to thank everybody out there that that's plugged in, that that watches everything that follows, even if I don't speak to you directly. You know what I mean? Of course, we love you. You know what I'm saying? And I and I hope that I was able to add something to this beautiful culture of hip hop that we all created. You know what I mean? I hope that I was able to add a beautiful piece to it. You know what I mean? And 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 and, you know, just add a part to it to make it more beautiful for for whoever whoever occupies it in the future i always got to give a big shout out to my team my radio super team lisa lena kim dj dn3 that's my dude uh professor x of course you know what i mean everybody who follows us the heat 100 dj coalition my guy rampage y'all know what's good i love you to death you know what i mean my everybody who runs with us man just like i said follow me across the board at tj super follow me across the board at radio super and uh i'm glad i could just give the, i told him i give him six bro that's my guys right there man damn i give him six right there yo let's do it yo there you have it Man, nothing but love and respect to my man TJ. Known TJ for a long time now. Always been a solid individual. Looked out for me in times when I was doing my thing with music and, um, you know, never forget that, you know what I mean? So nothing but love and respect to you, my brother. It was a privilege to have you on the show. And uh, make sure you guys are following him on social media. And shout out to my brother, Jimmy Nelson, on that camera. Make sure you guys subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tell a friend to tell a friend. The numbers are climbing. That's always a good thing. All right. Well, this was another one for the books. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And until uh, next time, stay tuned, stay blessed, stay healthy. And just give me five, y'all. Everything you get, you got the